There are 8 million YouTube talks online. But if you like, you want to really experience it, you have to come in person. It's great. I mean, you'll just meet such cool people. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Pejman. Happy Friday. I know that um, today is the last day of CPPCon. So um, for those who are watching us in the future, I um, just want to say that we're all exhausted and want to go home. So I'll try to make this talk worthwhile of your time. So thanks for being here. Um, the title of my talk is about building an extensible uh, type serialization system using partial template specialization. When I started preparing for this talk, I realized that it would be uh, doing injustice to the new uh, you know, features of the language if I just cover partial template specialization. So I decided to um, basically um, if, to, to prepare this talk in a way that would cover uh, all the approaches that we have uh, for designing extension points in C++. Uh, in fact, if I had, uh, if I could, uh, you know, re change the title, I would change it to a practical review of approaches to designing extension points. Um, this has two benefits. One is that it de-emphasizes the, you know, usage of partial template specialization a little bit. Um, the second is that it de-emphasizes building a serialization library because when we are talking about extension points, we are not necessarily just limiting ourselves to designing libraries that are for serialization. Uh, hashing functions and servers and everything else, um, when, when we create libraries, we need to uh, ask ourselves if we want to build it uh, in a way that extends the functionality to users of, and consumers of our library. Um, so this talk will not be uh, just about the partial template specialization. It would not be a deep dive into template metaprogramming either. Uh, it would just be practical, uh, you know, review of everything that we can do to extend our libraries in an elegant way. So what I want you to take away from this talk uh, is the uh, excitement about uh, the, um, you know, new and upcoming features uh, for a language. And also um, just the mindset of how do you design a library uh, that enables intuitive developer experience for its consumers. And there's a lot of ground to cover uh, here, so I ask that you keep your questions uh, for the end of this talk. Uh, but if there's something that you cannot wait to ask, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to answer. Um, let's start uh, with me. So um, the inspiration of this talk uh, came from my work at uh, Canon Medical Informatics, where I was working for the last four years. Um, at Canon, uh, we were building a, uh, a software for visualization of MRI and CT scan data sets. Uh, the picture you see on the right side of the screen is a visual output of our uh, software. Uh, it's just one of the uh, visual outputs. But you can imagine that to achieve this, uh, we needed to build a software with million, uh, uh, millions of lines of code. So um, doing it in a way that uh, is basically uh, building, building this software in a way that makes sure that it's um, you know, suitable for medical uh, uses uh, is challenging. Uh, it was particularly challenging when we decided to rewrite a critical component of this mission critical system, which was half a million lines of code. And um, it wasn't easy because every time we made changes uh, to our code, we had to have a way of making sure that it doesn't have uh, uh, you know, unintended side effects. Um, so we needed to come up with a system to test uh, our changes in an automated way. Our first try was to basically create a test infrastructure that would uh, call our uh, pipe data pipeline or whatever we were building um, the, uh, twice. Once with the you know, legacy version that we are trying to replace and once for this new version. So um, then we ended up with two uh, basically outputs of these systems uh, in memory so we could compare them. In fact, um, when we designed the system, we decided to derive these uh, outputs from a sim simple base class, but then 
uh, all, of, all because we wanted to make it easier to compare uh, the outputs. But at the same time, it wasn't easy because we had to write a lot of code to compare these outputs together. Plus, the uh, disadvantage of this approach was that the test infrastructure, uh, infrastructure was extremely clunky. Uh, we were calling this old uh, legacy system every time we were running this test, but the old system didn't change in behavior. It was the same. So the time that it took for us to run the test for the old system was the time wasted. So we improved this by creating a different, basically, uh, test infrastructure that calls uh, the, uh, a, a single version of our software with uh, you know, uh, multiple test cases. In our case, there, it was MRI and CT scan data sets. Uh, and every time that we have this output, we would serialize the output into files. So then we could compare uh, previous, uh, basically the new version of our software and how it behaves against a previous version that is stored in a file. But this too had some issues. Uh, managing files uh, in general is just uh, very difficult, especially when it, uh, when it is in, at a scale, at a scale that we wanted. So the test system was extremely clunky and the serialization that we were using to uh, uh, serialize our data into binary format right into these files was also specific to our use case. So if we, if we were done with this project, we had to reach, uh, throw away all of the code that we had written for comparison and you know, file management and everything, everything else. So this got me thinking, is there a way that we can write a system that uh, serializes binary format and manages and, uh, you know, all the results and compares the results against the old ones in a way that doesn't require files. So that means we would have a, you know, a remote compute resource somewhere uh, either in our infrastructure or out in the cloud that when we run our test, then we would basically serialize all the data and submit to it. But this meant that we need to build a serialization system that is generic enough that is applicable to all the possible you know, uh, use cases out there. And this is basically uh, the reason I came up with this talk and the serialization library. Um, so imagine this very simple case uh, where we have a find a student function that takes a username and provides a, some very basic information about them. Now, um, the uh, solution C that I came up with uh, requires writing this code as our test code, where you would basically um, create this workflow and then call your code under test, in this case, our find a student, with some test case that comes from the outside. It's given as a uh, parameter to our function, to our uh, workflow. And then we can describe our, uh, the behavior and performance of our uh, code under test by capturing values of variables and runtime of functions. Um, so I want you, uh, you to focus on the Tuka check function calls. Uh, these are the, uh, the function calls that uh, you know, we are going to uh, emphasize today. Uh, because these, uh, function, th this function takes uh, as input uh, one parameter, which is the name of the data point that we are capturing. And then the sep uh, separate parameter, which is the actual data point. Now, this data point can have any type. Um, the goal uh, in this talk is to come up with ways that we can actually serialize all these arbitrary data types. Now, we have just a few requirements uh, for our design. Our design needs to be intuitive uh, and give, uh, you know, developer ex uh, experience that would motivate people to actually use this library. Uh, of course, it needs to support uh, basic data types so that uh, consumers of the library don't need to uh, spend the time basically redefining all these basic data sets. But at the same time, it should be extensible enough so that our consumers can have a way of passing and using their own data structures and types as they do with basic data types like integers and strings. So these are the goals that we are going to evaluate different techniques against. 
Now, um, let's start with a very, uh, uh, very basic uh, techniques to extend the functionality of a given library. We all know function overloading. Um, function overloading uh, enables us to you know, define uh, basically a separate handling for a specific data types. Now, um, function overloading is great, but uh, for our case where we want someone to pass us a vector of dates and not worry about how it should be handled uh, would be a problem because then we need a separate overload, uh, overload for a vector of date. Now, um, we're going to uh, come back to function overloading, but right now we are, we are sure that it cannot, we cannot just use function overloading for our case. Um, a separate um, testing, uh, well, a separate technique for uh, adding uh, extensibility uh, to our library is by uh, offering callbacks. Now, uh, callbacks are great uh, because um, then we can, we can basically have our users define what we should run when they're calling our uh, library. But at the same time, uh, there are, there, there are, they seem to be you know, making the user interface uh, a lot clunkier if, if you are only going to use callbacks. So now you might be wondering, maybe we should use polymorphism or inheritance where we define some serialized method uh, that is pure virtual or an interface, and then we basically ask everyone who is trying to serialize their data types to inherit from this and, uh, or implement this interface. The problem uh, here is that this is asking for too much, especially for C++. No one is going to use our library if we ask them to you know, um, derive from this uh, interface and implement this uh, function. Um, this, we might get away with this approach in other languages. In Java, there is this JSON library, which is very uh, well designed, and it, um, the, it's, it's, um, it, it, its way of usage it requires basically um, using a JSON serializer and implementing that interface. So now we can pass a, our JSON serializer type um, to a register type adapter every time that we want to serialize something to JSON. The problem with this approach is that we want, uh, so this requires that we register these type adapters at runtime. Um, now, Java people might be okay with this approach, but we are using C++, which has inherent capabilities to mitigate this, to make sure that we don't have to tell uh, in at runtime, uh, look up basically how we want to serialize a given data type. We want to do it all at compile time so that it's efficient uh, when we are actually trying to serialize a given unknown type or external type. So again, back to our, um, our simple example, let's just imagine that uh, we have a two string method. What I want to uh, show here is uh, existing approaches that we have in our uh, you know, well-known uh, C++ libraries uh, for uh, designing extension points. Um, the most famous that I could think of is the output stream. When we want to uh, print some uh, data type of an external type uh, using output streams, then we can basically create uh, an operator overload and then uh, use uh, our type just like any other type. Um, we have a similar thing with QData stream in Qt uh, library when we have uh, when we have uh, basically function overloads for uh, simple data types and also uh, for uh, native Q uh, uh, classes like Q object. But at the same time, uh, we can extend this uh, the set of supported types to any data type by uh, using uh, overloading operator overloading. Another example is boost serialization, where um, we can open up the boost serialization namespace, define our own serialized function, and uh, make sure that once we compile our code, then from then on, if you are using a date, then boost serialization knows how to ha handle that. Of course, there is an alternative um, approach that we can take uh, with this library. We can uh, create a um, basically a member function and um, 
make it so that it can uh, use our private data types without any, um, any issue. And lastly, as an example, I would present a, st a standard format, which was added in C++20, and uh, it allows extending the uh, functionality of the formatter uh, by uh, specializing the format function uh, for the formatted class. So um, now we all know what fun function template specialization is. As a refresher, um, here is how, you know, when we, when we talk about template specialization, how the language allows us to handle different types. Um, we have a, uh, uh, basically a specialization here for a date object where uh, every time uh, that the, the, after the name lookup when the, um, when the compiler is trying to uh, resolve the data type and uh, it, they, it, it can find the overloads for, uh, for our uh, function. Now, um, of course, we can make it easier uh, with new language facilities that was added recently, but at the, uh, but at the same time, uh, the function template specialization is the same. Uh, we also have class template specialization where we can explicitly, uh, explicitly specialize a given data type. Now, we can go further and uh, Basically, so class template specialization is used for, say, standard hash, but this has problems uh, of its own because, again, for us, we want to make sure that any container or a map or any, any derived, uh, basically, type of our external type can be automatically handled. So the way that we can achieve this is through partial template specialization, where we define, basically, uh, multiple uh, type parameters, and then uh, we can basically partially uh, specialize some of those type parameters. In this case, I'm specializing the date parameter as the second type, uh, which allows me to actually make sure that every time that I use date uh, as the second parameter of when I call a printer, uh, it would uh, use this specialization instead of the default, uh, the primary template. Now, we use partial template specialization already when we use uh, enableIf and svine. Like in this case, uh, here is one possible implementation of svine that actually specializes, uh, specializes, uh, specializes uh, the first template uh, parameter. So that every time it's true, then the, uh, the second, uh, uh, basically, the, the, our specialization gets called. Now, because this specialization has a type, then we can access this type in our specialization. Um, here is basically the same uh, thing that we achieved with uh, template, uh, function template specialization through using enableIf, where we are basically asking our users to define this second specialization and say, if you are passing me date, then I'm going to do uh, this instead. Now, the way it works is that uh, when the compiler finds a type, it would basically try to um, pass this type to our, to our uh, template type T uh, in our is same, and it checks if uh, is same is returning false or true, right? Now we take this, uh, true, uh, if, if, if we are passing a date, then uh, the evaluation would be true, and therefore our enable if uh, struct would have a type. Um, and therefore, when we are asking for a type, uh, this kind of evaluates uh, without any issue. But imagine if you are passing now a data type that is not a date. In that case, uh, the evaluation would be false, and therefore our enable if construct wouldn't have a type uh, alias um, as a member. And therefore, when we are asking for a type, the compiler uh, fails to evaluate this or substitute our uh, expression. Now, we have um, this facility in our language baked in that uh, enables compilers or asks the compilers to make sure that uh, any failure in our substitution is not going to uh, be treated as an error that it would grace, gracefully handle cases where uh, the partial uh, template specialization is no longer va valid. So because we are 
using class templates here. Uh, at runtime, if we don't have any date, then uh, the, there is no instantiation of this function anyway. Now, um, of course, the code the snippet that I was showing you was a little clunky. We can clean that up a little bit uh, using enableFT and say is same V. So now we get a better, um, better code snippet, but at the same time, it still feels clunky. It's not what you would consider an intuitive developer experience if every time I need to do this. So uh, let's put that aside. We know that m maybe partial template specialization is not very you know, great at developer experience, but let's just say if you wanted to do this uh, using partial uh, template specialization, how would we go about doing it? Now, this is the same check function that I was showing you earlier uh, in this talk, and you see here that I'm passing some different types as the second uh, parameter. Now, if you wanted to use partial template specialization uh, as a technique to serialize all these random data types, then we can um, basically create a perfect forwarding to kind of uh, pass these values as is, uh, as they are to our serializer uh, function. Now, here I am using the serializer uh, to serialize all these data types. So now I can uh, focus on how do I want to handle these types, which in this case are uh, the value uh, type parameter. Here is uh, one possible um, use case as our um, as our library uh, users would see. If they want to specialize date now, they can do that by uh, cr basically uh, writing this code, which creates an object. It would, uh, they would just basically populate it with any, um, you know, any data points that we know how to handle, and they would return it. In fact, um, this is the best that we can do with partial template specialization. Of course, we can change how we are designing our return value and make this uh, fancier. But at the end of the day, uh, that's what we expect our users to do. Now, I, I say this because I want to uh, get back to you know, how we can actually expect less and it make, make our users happy when they're using our library. Now, imagine if this date specialization is not provided, is not visible to the compiler, then the compiler, when it encounters a date object, doesn't know how to handle it. And therefore, it uh, basically shows all uh, this you know, uh, compile time uh, error that is not easy to read because uh, templates uh, and you know, uh, template metaprogramming is just known for all those uh, you know, uh, long and undecipherable, undecipherable uh, compile time errors. But we can, we can mitigate that a little bit by making sure that any def basically as a fallback mechanism, any type that we don't know how to handle would basically be treated as a compile time error with a, an error message that we want. Now, in this case, we say if there is any type that we don't know how to handle through our partial template specializations that falls into you know, our primary template, then um, unless it is is it is already the generic value, which is our return type, then we want to basically make the compiler stop proceeding and treat it as a compile time error. Now, object, our objective from now on is to create these partial template specializations for our known types and then uh, have a way of basically um, making sure that our users don't need to uh, define them when they are using our library. Now, this is, this is perhaps one uh, you know, a slide that is very different if someone else was presenting here. Because uh, depending on our use case, the types that we want to treat as you know, our uh, native types would be completely different. Uh, for the library that I was uh, telling you about, we want to support binary data, large text. You know, uh, what if someone passes a file uh, system path uh, then we want to basically uh, handle the path and uh, use the binary data for it. So, however, uh, because we are not necessarily trying to you know, implement a serialization library here, let's just uh, con content ourselves with the set of types that you see on the right side. 
Now, we can either use a std variant if we can, or in the very basic uh, case, we can just use a union and a type. Now, we can create a type wrapper uh, to make sure that you know, our booleans and numbers would uh, essentially have a way of be representable uh, when, uh, through a sim sim simple type interface. Now, by defining that, then we can say, here is our specialization for a Boolean value. Now, notice that we are writing four lines of code just to explain how a Boolean value, uh, a, boole a value of a Boolean type should be handled. But we can even <laughs> add more code and say, you know, we, we want to basically say that our enable if statement there is only taking a type instead of just having all this, you know, kind of logic uh, squeezed into uh, that, uh, you know, the, the input for our enable if, we would just create a type alias, like, or in this case, a const, uh, const expert variable. Now, um, we can extend this functionality to all the other types. In this case, and our numeric types, uh, we, want, we want to handle, uh, you know, our signed integers separately, so we can create a partial template specialization for it. And then say that, you know, one possible way of implementing this is to say, you know, our is number sign type alias is always false unless it is an, an integral um, sign type that is not a Boolean. Notice the not a Boolean here because um, partial template specializations have a limitation in that they cannot overlap with each other. They are mutually ex exclusive. So that might feel, you know, that in here it's just uh, not is same. But when we are creating, you know, multiple of them and many of them, then it, bec uh, it kind of uh, comes in our way. It doesn't allow us to express our intentions very well. Now, um, in here we can somewhat help again with the way that we are expressing our intent by using uh, other facilities like conjunction, negation, and disjunction. Um, here I am basically uh, proposing a dummy uh, partial template specialization for a string. Now, of course, we know, you know, a, a better way of handling this is so that we can handle all types of a string, not just a uh, basic string car. How about arrays? Well, um, you might see in the wild something like this, which is uh, from an actual uh, library um, that says, Anything is an array if it is, you know, from an array or a set or a vector. Now, how many of these types do we have? What do we want to accomplish? If our uh, intention here is just to um, check if something is a container, then writing all this code is just not the right way of doing it. Now, we can clean up this a little bit by creating a type alias for as is a specialization because our uh, containers are, uh, you know, basically our templates themselves. Then we can basically check if they are, if if, if the, a given type is a specialization of these, uh, you know, templates. But again, we have the same problems. How many of these container types do we have in the language? Uh, what do we want to accomplish? Uh, if if we just want to know something is a container, so we can just loop over it. Uh, and iterate, uh, find the elements, and then serialize them uh, separately. Doing this is against our intention. It doesn't express that very well. Um, here is another uh, code that is actual real world code uh, from an open source project. Uh, it basically checks for a begin and an end uh, of a given type, and if uh, the begin and an end are there, it would assume uh, that it is an iterable. Now, if you were to use this uh, for um, basically expressing our intention with is array uh, type alias, then we can say any, anything is an is array if it is iterable but is not a string. Notice uh, not a string again because we don't want overlap between our uh, types, our, our specialization filters. Um, here is uh, basically the way that we can now write um, some a partial template specialization for our container-like types. Uh, we would loop over them uh, and then basically call serializer again um, for each element of our container. Now, we can go on and on. Here is uh, basically some specialization for a pair uh, because, say, if you 
pass a map, uh, then we end up with um, you know, pair as elements. So we need to know how to specialize them. The point here is not to show you elegant looking partial template specialization. My point here is that this cannot scale very well. That, that there are just too many types that make, uh, make it extremely difficult for us to express our intentions. And there are language facilities that help us better express those intents. Um, let's take concepts. Again, we are not going to go uh, do a deep dive, but just imagine how easier it would be if you use concepts uh, instead. Um, of course, concepts are introduced in C++20, so this may not be relevant for everyone who is implementing a serialization library. In particular, that uh, serialization library I told you about, which is about testing legacy code, she cannot use concept as the only means of you know, uh, extending its type support. Um, but I, I assume that you know the basics. Here is one example where we are basically creating a, a simple concept uh, using a requires expression that would check if a given type has a two string uh, uh, member function. Now, Notice that I am still using templates here, but at the same time, using uh, concepts as just constraint allows me to have uh, basically a better way of expressing my intentions. Now I can say if, if there is a type that has a two string method, then I want to basically use this last uh, specialization or overload for it. But if, um, if I don't know or if our, my type doesn't have a two string, then I fall back to my default uh, overload. Um, now we can take a step back and can reconsider our entire approach. Remember that perfect forwarding uh, way of serializing things? Now I can use basically a simple serialized call instead of uh, using partial template, uh, basically instantiating uh, my a template class. Now, because we are only using uh, template overload, uh, actually uh, overload, so I can just use a simple way of saying, here is how I want to serialize a null pointer or a Boolean. Um, what about numeric values, the arithmetics? We can say, all right, uh, I want to handle all the um, numbers by saying, uh, by basically saying, you know, if my type is satisfying uh, the integral concept uh, or a floating point, then uh, it should be, an, it's a number, and I want to handle that. The reason I uh, put this aside is because it doesn't have that is not Boolean. Um, and that's a major advantage of using this approach, because by by using concepts, then we enable ourselves uh, to get away with having some overlaps between our uh, specializations. Uh, we leave it to the compiler to find the right, uh, the, the, the right specialization that is uh, basically uh, matching the strongest constraint that we have uh, for our type. Now, um, about uh, strings that I showed you earlier. Uh, I was only checking for a string and uh, wider strings. Now we can just do this. Again, it's not a perfect code. It's meant to be the simplest way of doing it. Um, here is uh, how we can handle uh, car arrays and other fixed uh, strings. Now, um, remember this uh, code snippet? Uh, where we had this much code just to explain, you know, that the, our intent is uh, for our type to have a begin and an end. Uh, we can simplify that by just saying, uh, by, by just creating a concept iterable that has a begin and an end. In fact, we don't even need to do this because uh, con because C plus plus twenty already has a range library with a range concept. So if our intention is just to iterate over elements then um, we don't need to write uh, all that uh, template metaprogramming code. Um, if we wanted to, however, use our own container type, then we can take a look at what the standard considers as a container in a name requirement. And you can check for yourself, there is a long list of requirements that a type should satisfy if it is a container. 
And in fact, with concepts, it's very easy to express those requirements one by one here. Um, I managed to do that with three slides, but if I, uh, if only to just basically say, um, even the most uh, complex requirements can be uh, easier explained using concepts. Now someone reading this code would understand our intention. Here is something that we are defining as a requirement, and here is how we are expressing that uh, to the compiler. Um, I express a lot, uh, I, I emphasize a lot on this intention because I think the most important thing when it comes to writing a library is for, is to make our users or whoever is consuming the library, um, basically, um, and may enable them to go read the source code and understand how it works. Because in a lot of cases, we only trust a given library or a given component if you know how it works. Now, the problem with uh, serialization libraries uh, right now is because they want to support um, you know, older standards, it's very difficult to express those intentions. So the might have been a long time user of uh, serialization libraries, but never actually dare to look at the source code and how they work. Um, let's uh, wrap this up by just saying, can we use concepts just like we did for our container or you know, uh, creating a um, requires expression for our container uh, to create a requires expression for uh, random data types that we don't know how to handle. The ones that our users uh, should satisfy. So here, take this, uh, take this date uh, class again. Um, for our struct, we can just say, uh, we want to handle any type that has a serialized uh, data member uh, that provides our um, generic value. So in that case, uh, we can do what we did with iterable or container, create a concept, or maybe not even create a concept because it's so simple, and then use uh, basically that as our only specialization that we provide for our users to implement. Notice that unlike other concepts that we did, unlike all the other overloads, this is the code that then we can show to our users and say, take a look at this code. Here is what I want you to do. This is much easier for someone to read and understand than using a partial template specialization uh, sample. Now, um, here is basically um, a way for us to make sure that when a user forgets to uh, create uh, basically an overload for our type, they wouldn't get uh, the compile time error that says, I didn't match this concept. It, it, it wasn't possible to satisfy this constraint and that and that. We would just basically did what we did with our uh, temp uh, primary template uh, in our partial specialization technique um, here with concepts as well. Now, concepts are not uh, the only alternative uh, to partial template specialization. We can use uh, ADL as well. Um, the best way to explain ADL without going into um, you know, explaining all the rules and when it applies and not, is to show you this code example that I really like. Um, it's an end line uh, function that we all know, uh, it's, and it's uh, unqualified. We are not specifying uh, what namespace it belongs to. But we are passing the parameter to it, uh, the output stream that it, 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 requires, it, it, it requires. So when a compiler sees this statement, because it's a function uh, call expression, it would start basically checking if we have in our namespace any equivalent end line function. In most cases, we don't have that uh, you know, uh, namespace. Uh, so it checks for uh, basically the name, it looks up uh, for a declaration of end line in the namespace of the uh, input parameter that we are passing. In this case, the standard. Um, so it finds our uh, std endline and it would be able to uh, resolve uh, this uh, function call expression. Um, now, what does this have to do with uh, our uh, type serialization system? Um, the answer is that we can now basically, instead of 
passing a concept and say, hey, user, satisfy this, you can say, you can just write a member function uh, that takes, you know, um, th that basically has the same name as we want. And then because they pass their type as, you know, its argument, then uh, com at compile time, we can find that uh, member function. Um, this is already used in the while. Uh, the best example that I can show is app sales that has a, you know, basically requires anyone who is trying to support the supported types to create friend functions uh, for operator equality and uh, the app sale hash value. Um, so all we need to do is now to implement these uh, in the namespace of our type. It doesn't have to now be in, our, in the namespace of the library, the serialization library, or in this case, the hash library, which is great. And that's why you know, other modern uh, serialization libraries also make use of ADL. Uh, another good example is Nils Laman JSON a library that um, basically allows users to just implement the to JSON and from JSON objects for their uh, member, so for their external type. In that case, um, if I wanted to extend support for the serializable types to my date uh, struct, then I can just uh, basically write this function. And then, um, in fact, a lot of these serialization libraries um, provide macros uh, to make it easier for people to express uh, their intent. Now, I take issue with this. I think that if we are using macros, we are hiding, actually, uh, what the intention of this code is. If I don't know what this macro call is doing, um, I, cannot, um, I, I cannot understand what happens uh, when, this, when the compiler sees this. So, again, I think the best technique is one that is most uh, applicable to your use cases, but these techniques have different um, you know, different, different ways of explain, explaining your, expressing your intents. And um, I think the best technique is the one that expresses that the most uh, clearly. Um, so if we wanted for our serialization library to use ADL, then we can use a somewhat different uh, function, serialize, that takes our context, that enables us to um, basically create um, overloads for, our, for the set of basic types that we want, and then the uh, external types that we want uh, our users to provide and support. So uh, our users then can write something like this uh, in their, uh, as a member function. And uh, that's pretty much all they need to do. It doesn't even need to be a member function, as uh, you saw in the app cell example. It can't just be a you know, friend function that has access to the private members. Okay, so that brings us to the last point uh, in this talk, which is a static reflection. Now, what if we could actually express our intent without providing anything? Isn't it, isn't it our intention to serialize some, some type? If I am making use of a serializer uh, library, shouldn't the library be able to just handle the types? Why should I care about you know, implementing my own? Why should it be necessary is better word for it, or better question to ask. Now, um, take this example again. Uh, we are providing a date uh, uh, object as our um, you know, input uh, parameter, um, or a map of you know, strings to dates. The, at the end of the day, um, we, we, it would be nice if the libraries already knew how to handle these types. Um, and it's not too, uh, too difficult to explain the, uh, this by saying that all the other languages um, that do support reflection uh, have actually solved this problem. In fact, um, that JSON library that I showed you for Java already supports, uh, basically it has a default behavior for the types that uh, don't have an explicit uh, type adapter. Um, so, that um, path, um, execution path, might be slower than usual, um, but again, um, 
it seems like a problem that we can fix. And that's the, the only reason why I'm uh, including this section, even though it's not part of the standard as we know it today. Now, reflections may not make it to C++23, but uh, there are proposals that I recommend that you read just to understand you know, how it would look like in the future if you, were, if you were to write a serialization library or any uh, other type of library that uh, is trying to extend support for external types. Um, other than these two implementations, uh, the circuit compiler already has support for a separate um, way of expressing uh, reflections. But uh, the best way to learn about uh, these proposals or just uh, basically learn about reflections in general is uh, by uh, the YouTube videos, uh, through the YouTube videos that I've included uh, the names for. Um, but I just want to give you a glimpse of how these works. So let's start with the uh, technical specification draft um, that is uh, basically one way of uh, supporting uh, true types. Um, with reflection, our intention is to say, here is a type that I have, or here is, uh, basically, I want to have a way of finding information about that at compile time. Um, and then do, uh, basically, basically create patterns that I can then use at uh, runtime. Um, the, ref the technical specification draft would uh, basically make use of reflexpr operator to promote our type to this meta um, kind of type, which is a special, basically, which has is a type alias that has a kind of meta inf information. Um, so you can think of it as a meta object. But then, if you look at the code snippet here, it's uh, using uh, type aliases uh, for basically getting information as well. Like in this case, we are creating an alias to the, uh, the reflexpr um, output, and then getting the name of the, uh, again, type alias that we've defined already to uh, print that name at runtime. In that case, the get type name of a std string would then be the, the, you know, the name of the type that the std string actually is, which is basically a string. And then an integer would be expressed as an integer. Notice that right now, if you wanted to do uh, that get type name without reflection, um, there, I, I cannot think of a way of doing that. So um, now, in addition to just finding type names, we can also find the uh, basically the name of data members, uh, even if you know they are not uh, public. So in this case, I'm using get accessible data members. Um, Again, I'm defining it as a type alias, and I'm then basically printing the, uh, the information that I want. Um, here is some proposal that I, as far as I know, is not approved yet, but I think uh, would better explain how uh, the reflection uh, TS would work. In this case, I am making, uh, basically, I, I'm creating a J, two JSON impl, which is basically taking any type. Uh, it doesn't care, you know, it, we are not creating any constraint for it. But then we say, let's just check the member, uh, the accessible data members, and then basically print the name and then their values. Um, of course, this is making use of facilities that are not are already in the language, like reflexpr or unreflexpr in this case. In fact, the constexpr4 is also uh, new. But at the, at, at the end, the intention here is to have a way in our uh, basically uh, language to find this information that we otherwise have to rely on our users to support and implement. Um, here is a separate, basically, uh, they approach, um, the, the one that I showed you earlier is true types. Uh, this one is basically um, easier to maybe, uh, maybe read, in my opinion, because it's, instead of using the type aliases, it, it's basically using this meta info object. Uh, in this case, this is uh, 
I call it the value-based reflection. Uh, but I think this term is also uh, uh, used in the proposal for it. Now, um, the of course, what the code snippets that I'm showing uh, here, uh, they are subject to change. Uh, the end result that we get might be totally different. But the end goal is that we can uh, implement basically a default behavior for the types that we don't know of, and then have a way of our users basically overriding them by implementing their own. Um, this opens up new opportunities for, uh, for us in uh, ways of basically expressing the intent, uh, intent when it comes to uh, designing uh, libraries that are supposed to be extensible. Now, um, again, for a conclusion of this talk, I would uh, say that my goal was not to um, promote one technique over another. Uh, my goal here is to say that when we are designing a library, we need to think of all the techniques that are available to us and make use of them when appropriate. Um, designing really good libraries requires thinking really well about the uh, you know, expected use cases for it. When, when do we want our users to do something um, that we didn't expect? and how do we want our users to be able to express it. I think overall, you can appreciate that the, uh, the new techniques and you know, methods that are actually being introduced to uh, the language are making it even easier for us to express those intentions. And so I think that we should be optimistic about where the language is going and how we can use the language to build uh, easy to understand uh, software and libraries. Um, that concludes my talk. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, David Sankel, who's here as well, uh, because of uh, the time that he took uh, speaking with me. Um, thank you. If there's any question, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, um, no question? Yes, please. Uh, just wondering, um, Jeff uh, was curious uh, about spending uh, or with the project for in the development. I know that that's not even being talked about a bit right now, but uh, do you know of any sort of uh, uh, like movement for that? Uh, is that being used for this to be like that? Um, yes, so the question was, if I know when the reflection, um, the static reflection is going to land. Well, uh, I think the short answer is I don't know, and there are more qualified people who may uh, need to take more time to uh, basically design this better. But um, as I presented here, there are two proposals right now. Um, there is a reflection uh, TS draft, um, but there is also this proposal that I showed a simple code snippet for. Um, I think that uh, I, I think that there are more qualified people in this room who can uh, give better answer about um, you know the uh, content of these proposals. But um, I, I think the best way of uh, understanding how they work is through reading the proposals. Especially P twenty three twenty was the most helpful for me, um, which is fairly recent as well. Thank you. If there is no other question, um, I just want to thank you uh, all for being here. And I hope that uh, CVCon was as enjoyable to you as it was for me. Uh, thank you. <laughs>